Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the United States and China with Ambassador Chas Freeman, who chairs Projects International, Inc., and was a Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs from 1993 to 94, earning the highest public service awards of the Department of Defense for his roles in designing a NATO-centered post-Cold War European security system and in re-establishing defense and military relations with China. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia during Operations Desert Shield and Storm, was Principal Deputy Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs during the historic U.S. mediation of Namibian independence from South Africa and Cuban troop withdrawal from Angola. Ambassador Freeman worked as Deputy Chief of Mission and Chargé d'Affaires in the American Embassy at both Bangkok from 84 to 86 and Beijing from 81 to 84. He was director for Chinese affairs at the U.S. Department of State from 79 to 81 and was principal U.S. interpreter during the late President Nixon's path-breaking visit to China in 72. Chess Freeman, quite a resume. Welcome to World Radio. Glad to be with you. Uh, glad you could come on. Uh, probably too many things I want to ask about for the time we've got, but let's uh, start with, uh, I mean, uh, humanitarian concern here. How have you survived the horrific balloon assaults? Uh, do you have any injuries or trauma? Uh, well, I think we've all suffered from the balloonacy, as I call it. <laughs> yeah, um, this was uh, something we've uh, apparently been experiencing for a long time. I know there's some balloon club in Illinois that had its balloon, or Indiana perhaps, that had its balloon shot down by the U.S. Air Force. The mighty F-22 um, managed to do that. Um, but uh, really what this shows uh, is very sad. Um, the United States and China apparently are unable to handle a crisis even over a balloon, a technology that was perfected in 1783 uh, in France. Um, our political class went berserk. Uh, we look, frankly, like fools internationally uh, because it has come out that uh, while we had one balloon floating over us, I think not deliberately, I think this was pushed off course by the polar vortex and the jet stream, uh, but leave that aside. Uh, we deliberately fly three to four reconnaissance missions against China every day. Uh, and they don't seem to panic, although they don't like it. So I think we look a bit foolish. And uh, if we do get into a serious crisis, say there's a collision at sea, uh, there's an exchange of gunfire, there's another aerial co uh, in collision, uh, or there's some other shooting incident, or still worse, we get into a war over Taiwan, um, we apparently don't know how to handle escalation and crisis management. I, I've just heard President Biden say that he wants to avoid a new Cold War with China, but what would he be doing differently from what he's doing if he wanted to develop a new Cold War with China? So instead of saying that we're going to compete with China, but we'll cooperate in a few areas, he should perhaps reverse that. We're gonna cooperate with China, but compete with it where it's appropriate. Now that I notice is the formulation that the New Zealanders and the Australians have adopted after briefly experimenting with our formula. Um, basically, uh, our approach to China at this point is 99.9% uh, .9 military and 0.1% diplomatic. Now those proportions ought to be reversed. It was a mistake to cancel the Blinken visit to Beijing. Um, he had uh, three objectives uh, to follow up on the Bali meeting between uh, Secretary Gen General Secretary Xi Jinping and, and President Biden. Uh, one was to show the world that uh, we can talk to, to each other despite our many differences with the Chinese. Uh, the world wants us to talk and find a basis for cooperation. 
The second was to show that uh, we could manage the relationship so it wouldn't tip into a war. This too is something the world wants to see. The last thing on earth anyone wants or should want is a US-China war. And the final objective he had I'm, was, I think, to posture for the benefit of the American public to show that the Biden administration was in charge and tough, just as tough as the Trump administration had been on China. In the event, the results were the exact opposite. We showed we couldn't talk. We demonstrated we didn't know how to manage the relationship. And uh, President Biden yielded to domestic furor over uh, the lunacy, as I said, um, and in effect showed that he was politically weak and indecisive. I couldn't agree more, except I wonder if absolutely everybody wants to move away from war. Uh, I read in the Washington Post on Friday an opinion that we need dramatically yet more increases in military spending penned by a guy named uh, Roger Zockheim, who directs the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. And the Washington Post didn't mention that that foundation is funded by many big weapons companies, uh, which I suspect like selling more weapons. Uh, I mean, it, how much is this uh, uh, an interest here, the people who benefit from this? Well, I think it's clear that uh, the military industrial complex with the Congress very much a, a co-conspirator, um, does uh, benefit greatly from ramping up tensions internationally uh, with whoever they can, uh, whether it's China or Russia or Iran or North Korea. Um, but that doesn't mean they want war. They want to sell weapons. They don't want the weapons to be used. And they sure as hell don't want uh, to be on the receiving end of a nuclear attack, which is what we risk uh, when we talk about going to war with a country like China or Russia. Absolutely. How, how do you compare the U.S. military and the Chinese military? Because the, the latter is very much used as justification for these increases in the former. Uh, well, they're very different. Um, China, doesn't, China has one support base overseas in Djibouti. Uh, we also have a base there, so do the Japanese and various Arab countries and the Italians and the French and, and I think the Indians may be there too. Um, they have one, we have about 800. Um, in some ways we don't have a defense department, we have a, an offense department. Um, its objective is to ensure that wars are far, far away from our shores um, and um, China doesn't have the troops beyond its borders except in UN peacekeeping missions, where it is the largest contributor uh, of, uh, of any country to uh, peacekeeping uh, forces. Uh, so Chinese army and military are deployed domestically for defense purposes. Uh, we object to this because China now has the ability to uh, defend itself against uh, any kind of assault we could manage. We call this um, A2, D, A2, D2, you know, uh, um, area denial and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and blockage. Um, China can now uh, hit aircraft carriers out to about a thousand uh, kilometers away from its uh, coast. Uh, it has developed a range of weapons which we cannot defend against. It's done this because we have been pressing on its borders and we continue to dispute um, its uh, sovereignty over uh, the island of the province of Taiwan. Um, so we are involved in the Chinese Civil War on the side that lost, namely Chiang Kai-shek and his heirs. And this doesn't sit well with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, if we ever do get into a war, I think there are, there's only one thing certain. War is always a gamble. You never know how it's going to turn out. Uh, one thing is certain, and that is that Taiwan's democracy and prosperity will be destroyed. Um, that is a certainty. How much damage is done to the United States or to China is a big question. 
Uh, we don't have, as, I, as the balloon incident indicates, any way of communicating effectively to achieve escalation control. Um, our war plans, I believe, uh, assume that we can strike Chinese bases and territory on the mainland with impunity. But Chinese doctrine says flat, flatly, if you hit me, I must hit you back. Uh, and China is heavying up its nuclear forces to provide covering fire, if you will, uh, for any operation it feels obliged to mount against Taiwan. Are people right to see some parallels between Ukraine and Taiwan? I mean, for years, people warned against expanding NATO and building up predictably to the sort of crisis that's developed in Ukraine. Are we now in the period to be later dutifully forgotten of people warning against building up tensions in Taiwan? Yes, I think there is a parallel in that sense. Um, there are very few who are counseling a diplomatic approach to managing this issue. That's what we crafted in 1972 and, and perfected with the normalization agreements of 1979. Um, but uh, those are now largely, uh, by, by, the, by the way, uh, uh, the agreements we made to manage this issue have all been violated by us. Uh, we said no official relations with Taipei. Um, we, we now routinely send cabinet officers and uh, about to send as a senior defense official to Taiwan. We said no military uh, installations or troops on Taiwan. Now we have some uh, doing training missions. Um, uh, we said uh, that we would uh, not have a defense commitment to Taiwan. But the president has four times asserted such a commitment which of course he doesn't have the authority to do because that is the job of Congress. Uh, Congress has defaulted on its war power authority. So um, I, yes, I think it's comparable. There's another area of comparability and that is that Russia reacted uh, in the case of Ukraine to what it perceived to be an American effort to incorporate Ukraine formally into the American sphere of influence in Europe called NATO. Um, what we seem to be doing with Taiwan is increasingly incorporating Taiwan into an explicit military sphere of influence in Pacific Asia. Uh, and that uh, is exactly what we agreed we would not do. Uh, so the Chinese and we are caught in a feedback, feedback loop. Uh, we are uh, doing things that cause them to react we, we, uh, we have a policy that's based on entirely on military deterrence, but the more we attempt to deter militarily, the more they invest in countering our deterrence. Uh, so we're, we're in a bad uh, cycle. Although their significant increases still leave them at approximately a third of U.S. military spending, right? Well, it's interesting that we appear to measure our defenses in terms of of military spending because that uh, reveals a basic fact, which is that the US Congress treats the defense budget like a jobs program. It is a kind of military Keynesianism, uh, minus Keynes's insight that you should only uh, engage in deficit spending when the business cycle is bad. Uh, we do it all the time. Uh, the Chinese defense budget is well under 2% of their GDP. If they were a member of NATO, we would be castigating them for not putting enough money into defense. But they seem to have invested it well. Uh, they have developed um, the world's first ballistic missiles that are terminally guided, uh, that can, uh, in other words, hit a moving target at sea, uh, well, well offshore, as I said. Uh, they've developed the world's first effective hypersonic missiles. Their air-to-air -air missiles are outrange ours. Um, they have a formidable fleet of not nuclear submarines, but diesel electric submarines, which are virtually undetectable, arrayed for defensive purposes along their coasts. And uh, if we do get into a fight, I'm afraid we're going to have some nasty surprises. Perhaps we have some for them as well, uh, but uh, it's not a, the outcome 
in war games is almost invariably that China prevails. We lose most of our fleet, a good deal of our air force. Uh, we perhaps suffer nuclear strikes in retaliation for our strikes on China. Remembering that if you strike a nuclear missile base, even with conventional weapons, uh, the receiving end it can't be sure that you're not striking them, you're about to strike them with a nuclear weapon and are likely to launch. Um, and even if they know it's not a nuclear weapon, you're still hitting their nuclear deterrent, which is the equivalent of a nuclear attack. So we're playing with some, some factors here that I don't think the American public really understands. Uh, and uh, within the Beltway, uh, we are uh, on autopilot, I think. So we're speaking with Ambassador Chess Freeman. Uh, when you talk about prevailing in a war that has a high risk of going nuclear, and with scientists telling us that a nuclear war in one part of the world is likely to ruin the ability to grow crops in the entire world and leave the living envying the dead. But what, what, in what sense do we, do we think of one side prevailing? Well, I suppose uh, this is an example of the old adage that war doesn't prove who is right, but who is left. And uh, uh, I, I advise you to have another look at Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, uh, which nicely captured the mentality that we're dealing with here. And, and it was a documentary, not a not a work of fiction, right? Um, the, uh, the Chinese have to be aware that the United States is now proposing more new bases again in the Philippines uh, and has been building up in Korea and Australia and Guam and Okinawa and, and as you say, Taiwan. How does China view the, the U.S. military buildup around its borders? And how would the United States view similar actions by China? We saw how it viewed a balloon. Well, we know how we would react because when the Soviet Union put uh, missiles in Cuba, uh, we had uh, a nuclear confrontation with it, which ended with our conceding our missiles in Turkey, which had driven the whole uh, crisis from the beginning and removing them. Uh, we also know how we would react because, uh, although few people remember it, uh, the French took advantage of our civil war to install uh, Maximilian of Austria as the emperor of Mexico. The first thing we did after our war was over was to mass 40,000 troops on the Mexican border and inform the French that if they, if they didn't leave, uh, we were going to come after them. They left. Maximilian was then uh, sought and killed by Benito Juarez, the great Mexican liberal. And so I, I think we know how we would react. And I don't think the Chinese are reacting any differently. Uh, the, the point here is, uh, I, you, you named a list of companies, uh, countries. Not a single country has signed up to join us in a war with China over Taiwan, which is the only serious casus belli. Not a single country. There are various countries that are concerned about the Taiwan issue, Japan primarily, because it was once a Japanese colony. It has a, a strategic importance to Japan that is undeniable. It was from Taiwan that Japan launched its attack on the Philippines, Hong Kong, and Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, it was from Taiwan that the Dutch first shot their way into Japan back in the 17th century. So um, the importance of Taiwan to Japan is undeniable. But that doesn't mean they want to join us in a war with China over it. Uh, Korea will sit it out. Uh, Korea has been invaded 72 times over the course of its history, uh, mostly by people in what is now China. And uh, they don't want to get involved in this. Uh, the Philippines is happy to let us come and build bases at our expense and uh, on their territory, which belong to them, and train their troops. But when push comes to shove, I don't know where they would be on a, uh, a, a, a war with China. The Australians um, 
uh, have been our most loyal ally throughout history. They've been in every war, including Vietnam and Afghanistan and Iraq uh, that we have mounted. Um, uh, but there's a significant body of opinion in Australia now that objects to the notion of US bases um, in Australia that make Australia an obvious target for Chinese retaliation in the event of a general war. So I think, you know, again, uh, we're thinking in purely military terms. People in the region don't think that way. They think in political military terms or in political terms, and they are very aware that China is the greatest trading partner of every one of them. Um, and uh, their economies are interlinked with China in a way that means that they don't want China to be devastated. In the U.S. government, there seems to be a very thin line between an economic competitor and a military enemy, uh, if any line at all. Uh, China is viewed as seeking to dominate the world uh, as, a, as an imperial force. It's not clear whether that's economically or militarily. Uh, what, is, what is China's uh, goal in relation to the rest of the world? Well, I think they've stated it very clearly, and that is they want to restore their domestic prosperity and tranquility uh, and their civil war with, with the heirs of Chiang Kai-shek across the Taiwan Strait um, and become what they were historically, uh, the preeminent economy on the planet. Um, there is no uh, reason to believe that China wants to invade any of its neighbors. It's never threatened that. Uh, and uh, it's not looking for uh, Lebensraum, as the Germans were. Uh, it is not looking for, an, in, for colonies, the way the Japanese were, or the British. Um, it wants essentially to be left alone to restore itself to a position of dignity and prosperity uh, from which it fell. You know, when in 1820, uh, China was about one third of the global economy. Um, in, by 1949, when the civil war on the mainland concluded, it was 4%. Uh, China is now back, depending on how you count it, um, at somewhere around a fifth or, or more of the world economy. Um, and uh, so I don't think there's anything strange about China resuming a position globally that it had for millennia. Um, what is strange, what is difficult, is that since 1870, we have become accustomed to being number one economically and militarily and in every other respect internationally. We're having psychological difficulty adjusting to a world in which, uh, to coin a phrase, we need to compete with other people. We can't just order them around. Should we be investing in therapy maybe more than in uh, aircraft carriers? We should be investing in ourselves. We should be fixing our broken infrastructure, repairing our ridiculously and ineffective educational system, um, breaking up the oligopolies that have replaced competitive capitalism, uh, which are able to administer prices at will um, and therefore reduce our competitiveness. Uh, we need to increase, uh, reform our immigration procedures uh, to bring in people who contribute uh, directly to the economy, especially to the high tech end of it. Uh, we need to redirect our students uh, more toward technology and away from uh, whatever the alternative is, basket weaving or whatever they're doing. And, and uh, we need to do a lot of economic and political reform at home. We need to fix the venality of our legislative branch. Uh, we need to reduce the imperiousness of our executive branch. And we need to put the Supreme Court back on its meds. I'm inclined to agree with most, if not all of that. We've got a, a few minutes left. Chess Freeman, uh, how does China view the war in Ukraine, if you know, and how do you view the war in Ukraine? My, my view could be summed up in the slogan, Russia out of Ukraine, NATO out of existence. I, I don't know if you would agree with that. Well, I might not, but I think the uh, Chinese view is, uh, is a straddle. On the one hand, China is the 
most prominent and uh, uh, serious defender of the Westphalian bargain. And that is the, a world based on the sovereign equality of states. Um, and therefore, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, like the Russian earlier annexation of Crimea, like our uh, separation of Kosovo from Serbia, uh, are all opposed by the Chinese in principle. On the other hand, they have a 4,000 mile border with the Russian Federation and, and related states. Um, uh, the United States has branded both Russia and China as adversaries and is acting accordingly. That has pushed them into the arms of the Russians, and they're not so foolish as to want to oppose Russia. Uh, they don't support the Russians in Ukraine. They have been actually pretty good at uh, observing our sanctions, even though those are unilateral, uh, not authorized by the UN and therefore illegal uh, under international law. They have, they have nonetheless, as a matter of pragma pragmatism, respected them. Uh, what do I think about the uh, uh, the Ukraine war, I think uh, it was entirely avoidable. The Russians made a real effort to get a negotiation going that would have neutralized Ukraine, but left it free to join the EU, uh, which is a very good solution, or was. Um, we rebuffed the negotiations, um, basically straight on them, as did NATO. And um, the result was that uh, Putin, really at the last minute, I think, because he had not told his generals what he was going to do, he had not lined up the logistics for an invasion, and he didn't have an effective plan, and he probably was misled by his own intelligence people, uh, he, he invaded Ukraine. With what objective? Uh, I think it was essentially to secure the Russian-speaking areas of Ukraine, uh, which are the Donbass and, and, uh, and uh, the south uh, around Odessa. Uh, as well as Crimea. Um, our reaction probably surprised them. Um, anyway, we're in a war of attrition. Um, there's a lot of triumphalist talk uh, and a great deal of war propaganda filling our media. Uh, I don't believe it. Uh, I think Ukraine has effectively been partitioned. I think that is tragic. And the only question is, where is the line of partition going to end? Uh, nobody seems to have a war termination strategy. So this is going to go on until it ends. And we keep saying we're in there for as long as it takes. As long as it takes to do what is never explained. Very, very good point. Among many very good points, uh, we've been speaking with Ambassador Chas Freeman. Uh, he was the principal American interpreter during the late President Nixon's path-breaking visit to China in 1972. We'll have links to his website and writings up at talkworldradio.org. Chas Freeman, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. It's a pleasure to talk to you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.